it seems to be working. We will not get stuck here, we're all live. And uh, we hope to uh, catch up also on the, on the time, uh, so that you get your lunch in time. With, uh, hopefully, a uh, very interesting panel on an issue that matters more now than ever. Uh, human rights in our region. My name is Gerhard Knaus. I'm uh, the chairman of a Berlin Istanbul based uh, NGO, the European Stability Initiative. Um, and we have here four panelists who will discuss with us uh, the question of focus and time of deterioration. Now, we already had two interventions, two short ones this morning, which hinted at the problem. Uh, the irony is that at this moment um, we are reminded of course always of the great giants of the European human rights movement, the dissidents, Václav Havel and Andrei Sakharov and others. We are reminded of them because all the big human rights crises in Europe are carrying their names. And the irony is that at this moment, this year, these prices have largely gone to people from the eastern neighborhood region. Uh, Anna Mamadi's name has been mentioned. He won the Council of Europe Václav Havel Prize this year. But he's in jail. Leila Yunus was one of three finalists for the European Parliament Sakharov Prize, which uh, appreciates work for human rights worldwide, one of three. She's in jail. And last week I came back from Oslo, where the Norwegian Helsinki Committee was giving its Sakharov Prize, which was established in coordination with Andrei Sakharov in 1980, to the political prisoners in Azerbaijan. Of course, by definition, they're in jail. Now, the, the irony, and this I think is what is captured in the title, the word deterioration. The irony is that at this very moment, when human rights uh, are under stress, Europe seems to be waking up. There seems to be growing interest in what is happening in this region. Suddenly we have Azerbaijanis and others becoming household names in European politics. And if this continues, then in two years we will talk about Anna Mamadli and Leila Yunus and many others in the way we talked about the people of Charter 77, or the Polish Solidarity, uh, a few decades ago. But this was not supposed to happen. We were not supposed to talk about dissidents and the power of the powerless in 2014. So what is happening? At the same time, we had the dramatic events in Ukraine, which, of course, inspired both hope and fear. Hope for the strong role of civil society, and fear for the return of war, and scenes that again we remember from the Balkans in the 1990s. So what is Europe going to do? What is the role of civil society? And what, given that all these arrests have happened in Azerbaijan, why are we chair the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, paralyzing what used to be the premier human rights institution in Europe, the Council of Europe? What can the European Union do? Which of course is also committed to human rights, which has tools, which has interests and above all which has values, but which up to now, as we've seen, has not always been very effective, everywhere at least, to put them into practice. To discuss these and other issues, focusing on the question of what's deteriorating and what the EU should refocus on, we have four panelists from uh, the EU, and interestingly, and of course logically from Sweden, a country that has not only played a leading role in establishing the Eastern Partnership, but also has played a leading role in pushing the human rights discourse, both in the Council of Europe and in the EU. So we are very happy to have Ambassador Martin Hagström here. Then we have representatives from the region and from civil society, uh, Shala Ismail from the Women's Association for Rational Development in Azerbaijan, Alexander Lelevenchuk from Euromaida, SOS, and of course, Aldo Sarkos from the Helsinki Citizens Assembly in Banatsar, Armenia. Let us proceed in chronological, I mean, in the order of the program. Uh, eight minutes maximum, I suggested, because we are late and we do want to have a little bit of debate. Uh, and let's start first with Martin Jackson. So, yes. If you can do it in five minutes, it's also good, because I've had some. But, uh, but eight minutes, I'll cover. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, 
question first said that I think you have to describe the challenges that we are facing very well. And I just wanted to say to the Azerbaijani colleague that, of course, we are very aware of, of the situation in, in your country. And, uh, first of all, I just wanted to, since I'm the first uh, speaker from an EU uh, member state from the EU, which is here in, in person, I wanted to say that I'm, I'm very happy to be here. This is actually my fourth uh, society forum that I, that I, I visited and uh, was also a little bit involved in the organization of the first civil society forum which took place during the Swedish EU presidency back in 2009 uh, in, in Brussels. And uh, I think it has been very interesting to follow the development of, of this forum and uh, how it has evolved, to, to my understanding, uh, into uh, a more self-assured forum, which is, is ready to, to, to take its, its place uh, in the in the Eastern partnership uh, process. So I, I would, maybe it looks, this looks different from where you, where you sit, but we would have to follow discussions uh, over these days here. But I, I would say that quite a lot has happened since we started this uh, process, or since you started it, and, and, and uh, we were happy also to, to uh, participate uh, and have been happy to participate along the way. And it, it will be very interesting to see how you decide to develop this forum uh, further at this meeting today. Uh, I see a lot of untapped potential. Uh, I think what was, what was mentioned here earlier about uh, putting a more forceful civil society message on the table for, for us, for, for the government representatives, I think this is something that, at least for, from us, from, from Sweden side, and I'm sure from, from the EU side, we would be very happy to, to, to get from you uh, and see as a very important contribution to the development of, of the of the Eastern Partnership and our, our uh, relations. We are very eager to listen, and from Sweden side, I can assure you that we are also very happy to, to help you in, if that is, is needed to get these messages uh, across. Uh, in the on, on the multilateral state cooperation level. So, uh, also on the Eastern Partnership, uh, I get some questions also in the reception yesterday about you know what about the Eastern Partnership now? Will it fall apart? Uh, is it still a useful useful format? I want to assure you also again that from from Sweden side and again from the EU side. The answer is, is very clear, that we see this still as a very useful and very important format and that from, from our perspective it is very important to keep it together. I think this very forum, this very cooperation between civil society organizations from all over the region is, is, is part of the answer why this is so, so important and why we see still lots of use in, in operating uh, between these countries that have chosen very different costs yeah, in several respects, but where many of the challenges continue to be, be the same. Um, and uh, I think here it's clear that Eastern Partnership is definitely, well, to me it's clear that Eastern Partnership is definitely not the problem here. Eastern Partnership, uh, and what is Eastern Partnership? It's more cooperation between the EU and, Eastern, and your countries uh, and the people in, in your countries. It's about EU approximation, it's about EU support, and Conditionality linked to that support, putting clear demands uh, on your countries in exchange for, for taking steps uh, forward is very much part of the, of the, of the solution. Uh, and uh, this very gathering again, I think, is, is very much part of this. And I'm aware that for some of you, this is also entails some, some risks uh, engaging with the EU. So at the same time, I think, and, and here again, here is where the civil society so much comes in. I mean, the, the real, uh, the real power that can change things in your countries for real, uh, the real movement has always to be internal. What the EU and what we as member states can do is, is only so much. We can support. We can. Um, we do have big support programs. We can make statements, we can uh, discuss the situation of, of, of human rights with, with your leaders, we meet with them. 
but uh, the real movement for change always has to be internal. There has to be political will. Uh, it has to be an ability to see beyond the interests of, of, of the few, uh, or see beyond the interests of, of maybe an oligarchic uh, power structure that we have in, in some of the countries. There has to be strong public support. There has to be an openness for, for change. And here also is where the civil society, I think, very much comes in. Because you can be instrumental in building that uh, strong public support and in fostering that openness for, for changing things in, in, your, in your society. Uh, so I've almost used all my eight minutes, and uh, now I come to the theme of the, of the panel, <coughs> human rights. So as I said, very much agree with, with, uh, with what you said. The situation in the region is, is, is uh, not good. It's very different in different countries, very different, different challenges. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that we will hear more about the different challenges in the different countries here. Uh, I'm happy to, to comment more in, 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 in individual uh, country cases uh, later on. But it's clear that there are, are problems to be tackled everywhere. We have the problem of political prisoners that we, we see in, 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 in several of, of other countries. We have restrictions on freedom of speech, restrictions of freedom of association and, and, and assembly. One issue that I would also like to, to raise here, which has not so much been the focus previously of previous forums, but I see now that there are a number of organizations here that focus on this, is the issue of, of, uh, of uh, gender equality, where women uh, in particular are, are not protected from, from domestic violence and, and, and some other, other practices. Are not allowed to take their their place, their right to place in 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 leading developments in, in their countries. Uh, I may be mistaken in one or two cases, but I think as a rule, the region, your countries, are among the worst in in Europe when it comes to female representation in in, in Parliament. Uh, there are no uh, women uh, presidents or, or or prime ministers uh, in, in in your countries. Uh, and of course, the, the pay gap, the gap in, 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 in salaries between men and women and men is, is, is big. This is also true for, for EU member states, including my own country. Uh, but we are, are trying to, to, to work on this. And there are some Swedish organizations here that deal with this uh, issue. And uh, I will take the opportunity to, to talk to them. Another important issue, which is also very much linked to coming closer to the EU, is anti discrimination. This is uh, has, it's very high on, on the agenda given the, the visa liberalization uh, processes. This is about not dis discriminating against any, any minorities, uh, so be it uh, ethnic, be it religious, or based on sexual orientation. And this is uh, also an issue which is very much about the commitments that your countries have, have taken upon themselves in forums like, like the, the UN or the Council of Europe or the Eastern Partnership. And again, there, there are Swedish organizations that are present here today that, that uh, would be, uh, I'm sure, interested to discuss how, how cooperation can be taken further into this area. Uh, so, just to round up, yes, uh, has the Eastern Partnership helped? Uh, and, and what can be done. So I, I, I think, well, has it helped? Yes, it's, it's part of the solution, I think. Uh, it's a forum where we have all of your leaders have signed up on, on three summit declarations, uh, where it clearly states that the basis of cooperation is, is uh, common values, human rights, uh, fundamental freedoms. And uh, human rights are important parts of any document that the EU has signed with, with, with your countries. And uh, also the EU has an approach which is called more for more. It means that countries that do, have, do more progress uh, in the area of human rights and, and, and democracy uh, will also get more support from the EU. This is part of this conditionality. conditionality <laughs> so on the implementation side, there are many problems. We, we don't see the kind of implementation that we would have liked to see. I don't think it's all back. 
I think we have seen progress, in particular in the three countries that have signed association agreement and, uh, and uh, even comprehensive free trade uh, areas. And I hope to see much more progress there, uh, because the agreements themselves, they are the roadmap for, for reforms, and we will more monitor this. I hope that you will monitor this very closely, how these reforms are, are, are implemented. Uh, in the countries that are less interested in coming closer to the EU, we do see less progress. Uh, that, is, that is here. And this is also an area where, where this the functionality and, and incentives are, are, are less, that, that is kind of the, the basis of the Eastern partnership are, are less, less clear how, how we can make them, them work. But we, we continue to, to work with, with all the instruments, uh, instruments that we have. So I, I think again, just then to, to round up, I'm aware of your story, uh, sterling. Uh, real change can only come from within. Civil society, very, very important. Uh, we will use whatever options we have when it comes to support political dialogue to, to uh, support you in, in, this, uh, in this process. But I think one area that I would, I would like to highlight is the need for awareness raising uh, in, in, your, in your countries about the kind of commitments that your countries have, have taken upon themselves, uh, including in the format of the of these partnership, where I will see a, a, an important role for, 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 for the civil society. I think monitoring and using these, uh, these uh, commitments of your countries is another area where I think it's, it's, um, uh, there is a clear role, possible role for, for, for the civil society for putting pressure on, on countries regarding the implementation. And again, I think that this platform, this civil society forum, is important. Uh, it gives you a place at the table in a big number of, of, of meetings of, on the intergovernmental level. Uh, the Riga Summit is, is coming. We are very interested to hear your ideas on what these partnerships should be about in the future, what areas we should focus on. Use this platform uh, to uh, influence us. Thank you. So, uh, a few issues raised, political prisons, gender equality and discrimination, I'm sure we'll discuss them more, but now let's head to our region itself, to Shana Ismail uh, from Azerbaijan. Media, how the media trace NGOs. 
whether the civil society really makes huge contribution. So that's also the question mark. And the third growing confrontation, which personally is very heavy for me to talk about, is the confrontation within the civil society. We have a very big fragmentation inside. We have a big division. There are the organizations which obviously tolerate what is ongoing and those who are criticized of what is ongoing. But unfortunately, the breakdown is not as simple as this. It's not just non governmental and NGOs. It's not Congos and NGOs. We have a variety of NGO types in Azerbaijan. These are Pingos, business NGOs, Mongols, my own NGOs, Mongols, mafia NGOs, Congos, computer NGOs. Well, it sounds as an anecdote, but this is our truth. And unfortunately, it is very hard now to identify who is who. And now with this growing pressure and growing um, difficult environment, legal environment in Azerbaijan, with what the laws related to the NGO activity has deteriorated, has been amended several times, and practically it has become very difficult to work for the NGOs uh, in Azerbaijan, not only for NGOs, but also for international relations and donors with the most recent amendment. If you put aside from that, I understand the concern of the government also to identify who is who. So let us see that these reforms, let us assume that these reforms are for certain cleaning ups. And then the dilemma is within the civil society, how is it possible to work with the government? If the all the funding available or all the cooperation available is replaced by the governmental funding and governmental support, that is why nothing wrong in that. But how is it perceived inside of the sector? Is working with the government or for the government perceived positively? What is this delicate border? How can we manage to stay strong? independent and at the same time constructive and cooperative with the government. What is wrong here? Another thing, financial sustainability, which is of course crucial for our operation. If we want to have some other independent sources of funding, and in case the international funding is less available now, whether the NGOs can sustain themselves, can make income generation for them, can enter into the commercial contracts with a uh, with this non-profit uh, within this non-profit framework, of course. Well, I come back to this confrontation between the civil society and the public now. Whether the public is ready to pay for our services, do we really meet their needs, and whether we could uh, have this social order from the public to be able to sustain us even without the governmental funding. So as you can see, there are more questions than answers. And to tell the truth, the big concern now in Azerbaijan is felt in every single organization. Even those who are so-called pro-government or loyal to the government, even they do not know who their future will be. At the moment, the most important is to survive. Physically, financially, but most important, morally. To stay to the principles of human rights to ensure that we do not uh, do not escape from the country, we do not leave the country. Unfortunately, we see this kind as well. And also to be able to sit on the common table with all the sectors, including the government, and actually put our concerns on the table and be able to talk about that. So this is where we need you, international. We need you, we recognize you as a very important international actor which is able, which has all the power and the big education inside our countries to put your will on the table as well. And we don't want you just to observe the processes. We want you to be the active participant in what is going on. Otherwise, that would be too late. If you are talking about the civil society, I believe you also want to see it stronger and independent. Please, help us with this time. This is my message. Thank you.
thanks very much for describing the dilemmas that face uh, any organization now in the of the German. I, I think it's particularly true for human rights organizations, which in some ways are just under the most pressure. Uh, and here's a very different situation. The uh, other end of the Eastern partnership, Ukraine. Give us a sense of what you see as the major trends. Um, okay, it's fine. Good. Uh, uh, so, hello, my name is Sasha Vinyanchuk, uh, and I was represented uh, here uh, as uh, representative of Euromaidan SOS. Uh, Euromaidan SOS was a volunteer initiative. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's working, but it's not too much. Uh, it was a volunteer initiative uh, which was born in uh, Mexico. I think it would be better like this. Translation. Translation. Well, with techniques. So, uh, Euromaidan SS was a volunteer initiative uh, which was born together with the protests uh, at the uh, Maidan in Ukraine one year ago, but uh, in real life my day job uh, is with Human Rights Protection Organization Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine and also with the Eastern Partnership Minorities Network. Um, so, uh, uh, I will be today here uh, kind of devil's advocate uh, because uh, our distinguished moderator said that uh, uh, human rights matter now, uh, even more than always, but I should say that human rights matter always, really. And unfortunately, to my very deep regret, uh, for many years since Eastern Partnership was established, many national platforms were neglecting the issue of human rights and trying not to put it on the agenda of the national platforms and avoid it uh, in the sake of cooperation and dialogue uh, with the government. Uh, and we needed war in Ukraine and crack down on civil society in Azerbaijan to bring us here at this table and to make a human rights topic for panel one of this forum uh, a bit too late. Uh, Ukraine is going through unprecedented suffering only for one year. Only after Maidan uh, protest at Maidan, we had uh, 120 persons die. Uh, brutally uh, slaughtered in the downtown of our capital by uh, Yanukovych regime. 75 persons are still missing and most probably also dead. And nobody is brought to responsibility until now. Crimea, annexed by Russia, uh, where ethnic cleansing is ongoing. And I know that at my place, uh, it was supposed to be uh, uh, Mustafa Jamilov, leader of Iranian Tatars, and person who struggled for human rights back in the USSR, uh, who spent uh, years in prison, and who was on the longest counter strike among political prisoner, prisoners in the USSR. Now he is deprived access to Crimea, to his own home, and to his own people. And, uh, as I said, ethnic cleansing is ongoing in Crimea against Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. People, people are being uh, enforced to disappear, tortured, and beheaded, even. Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and uh, somebody mentioned here at the panel that we are in the fear of war. We are not in the fear of war. There is war going on in Europe and many other places and it's going on in Ukraine. And it's already, according to the official data of the Ukrainian government, it's already 2,000 persons who perished in this war on the Ukrainian side. And according to the information collected by uh, mothers of soldiers and other Russian NGOs, uh, approximately the same amount of people uh, was killed on the side of Russia. Nevertheless, Russia does not acknowledge that they are sending troops to Ukraine. Uh, I don't even know how many people have been wounded and how many people uh, became disabled because of this war. And uh, unfortunately, the burden of this war is again put on the shoulders of civil society in Ukraine. Civil society is uh, hosting uh, IDPs, feeding them, collecting money, raise funds, 
and our government is doing nothing. They need half a year to adopt a law about internally displaced persons. Uh, what is going on in the east of Ukraine? Uh, I think it's very hard to comprehend. It's even not Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, or Karabakh. Uh, it's a territory where warlords uh, like those about which we heard from Africa are fighting with each other, taking hostages, torturing people, and from recently uh, establishing a, a capital punishment on the territory of their republics and starting just to uh, execute people on the daily basis. Dozens of people. Uh, on different charges, like uh, even sometimes uh, just being not uh, so liked by their neighbors. Uh, so what is going on in Ukraine is really, really bad, and we need to face it. That it's a new stage in, in, in the history of Europe. But uh, I also want to touch upon uh, what was done by European institutions in Ukraine before and after uh, events of last year. Uh, I understand that there is a politics and you need to negotiate. You need to negotiate with Lukashenko, uh, you need to negotiate with Aliyev, with Dr. Muhammadov, and etc. But, uh, very often in negotiations with our government, <coughs> European institutions are neglecting the issues of human rights. And they think that maybe human rights are not so much important uh, in comparison to the pipelines, oil, gas, and whatever. But, in the end, human rights are the most important thing, and you see it now in Ukraine. What, was, what happened in Ukraine, it's a consequence of years of neglections of human rights issue in the politics. And um, we are always saying that, please, even to the new government, even with regard to the fact that the new government of Ukraine is struggling with very uh, complicated conditions, but even for them, please, give more for more and less for less. Until they ratify for the statute, until they punish people who were involved in the mass killings of protesters, until they uh, reform law enforcement, until they reform prosecutor's office, until they reform non-discrimination legislation, don't give them anything. And if you give them something, please involve civil society in scrutiny over them. And uh, the last point, uh, shortly before ratification of the association agreement with Ukraine, Commissioner Fule uh, was in Kiev and he had a meeting with civil society and he had a variety of NGOs working on different issues. And he spent an hour talking with NGOs, working on very important issues, yes, very important, ecology, uh, uh, elections, gender equality, etc. All these issues are important. But for the three human rights protection organizations, uh, he left three minutes in there. And he said, you have each, you have a minute. And I said, dear Mr. Commissioner, unfortunately during this minute, I cannot say all what I want to say about suffering of people in this country and about their violated rights, but I will just remind you that what happened in Ukraine was called a revolution of dignity. And the main slogan of this revolution was human rights are above all. And I just kindly want to remind you that human rights are above all. Thanks a lot, Marco, for reminding us of how serious the situation is in Ukraine and for reminding us of what inspired the big changes earlier this year. Uh, having spent 10 years working in the Balkans in the 1990s, this world of warlords does remind me of something. We've seen in Europe, but again, we thought it was behind us when the wars in the Balkans ended. But of course, one thing that you hinted at, which did work in the Balkans, in the end was international justice, which brought some of those warlords to trial, and some of them are still standing trial today in The Hague. Um, let's go to our last speaker, uh, Arthur Sakuns from the Helsinki Citizen Assembly. Uh, does this work? It does work. Uh, I think the 
směrec, to je skvělý švadl. Spasíme, já čas vzpomněl samý pěna v formě gražnáctvů. Ovšem, v Bruseli, kde byl přednáčen klasis, já zadal tím vatus, já byl tak dalším facilitátorem našem, jak z Rasii vaše v tom procesu dostočného partnerstva, rasistický faktor, jak to učit, aby se mě, já pomněl očin interesný, to je taková reakcia, to je takové umáčování. To je zesný, já rozsmatrím vaše takové vlání rasistického faktora na realizaci projektu programu dostočného partnerstva. I k zažalení, to umáčování prevolilo k tomu, že mě okazali tam, kde se čas nalazí. Второй, который я хочу сказать, характеризующий параметр, в каких странах или какие страны все-таки смогли проявить волю и подписаться на социальный договор. Молдова, Украина и Грузия там эти страны, которые за период независимости глаз изменились через переворот и через народные гражданские профессии. В Беларуси, в Азербайджане, в Армении, по сущности, власть передавалась или по наследству, или по смерти, или же насилие был заставлен, чтобы власть был принижен, поставлен к нам другой человек. Да? Единственное было это дворцовый переворот в Армении в 1998 году, вынудили их вернуть в Россию, а потом Роберт Курчанян в 2008 году, 1 марта, применяя силу, поставил на свое место своего соратника, при том, чтобы были властные коридоры, то есть не дано степенье личности. Это тоже очень основная нация. А в всех проблемах, когда здесь упомянула Саша, периодически не говорили, не говорили, что так называемые демократические изменения в нашей стране, это имитация не имит, 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 имит. Конечно, Саша совсем любил в последнее время упомянуть, что на бумагах все хорошо. Да, на бумагах все хорошо. И все... Не слышно? На бумагах все нормально, и на этом бумагах и наши европейские партнеры, и международные партнеры считали и принимали отчеты о выполнении обязательств. Роль гражданского общества не только мониторить, но и мониторили, не только собирать факты, и это тоже сделали, но также влиять на ситуацию. А как влиять на изменение ситуации? Как добиться того, чтобы власти структуры были подотчетны? Только опять с помощью не только национальных механизмов, но и международных механизмов. Но мы видим, что международные механизмы тоже имитационно иногда подпосылят наши проблемы. Я хочу привести конкретный пример. Значит, я уже упомянул 1 марта 2008 года, когда Среди первых дня в Ереване 10 человек были убиты из участников мирных протестов, которые выступали против фальсификации Рассказа Президента Ереване. После этого, несмотря на то, что все наши требования о том, чтобы были проведены расследования и выявлены виновники, несмотря на то, что виновники явно были, это власти, представители власти, да, продолжается процесс ассоциативного договора. С теми, которые за это преступили. Естественно, перед Вильнюсом, перед тем, которые нарушали систему отечественной права, они же отказались. Ведь поставлены перед фактором. 
И после этого начинается очень неожиданно. Ничего неожиданно нет. Расположительный, когда встретился с нашим институтом гражданского общества, был в шоке, да, как это может быть, за один день человек изменяет полиции. Он уже давным-давно изменил. Просто на бумагах все время представить, что все реализуется, все хорошо. И все наши предупреждения, все наши отчеты в рамках гражданского форума, также доклады о ситуации прав человека, они реально, к сожалению, не имели на измене позиции. Следующий вопрос, это я хочу ответить, что кроме национальных таких факторов на национальном уровне, которые мы имеем как угрозы или факторы, которые отрицательно влияют на ситуацию прав человека, то есть не состоявшиеся институты, государственные правовые институты, не отсутствие независимых судебной системы. Все это к этому прибавилось также внешний фактор, который мы тоже сажали в международном отношении достаточно внимания не вылучили. То есть все авторитарные вот эти режимы в лице Кремля нашли своего такого э, пособника или защитника. И маленькие режимы авторитарные получили свою поддержку в лице нового такого международного интернационала во главе Путина. А раньше же что, в России не было проблем? Геноцид по отношению к чеченскому, к чеченскому народу. А это тоже достаточно не было уделено внимание. А что, раньше в России не было системы нарушения прав человека? Конечно, было. Это влияло на позицию политику э, европейского сообщества по отношению к нет, не было. И только когда, как русская пословица, пока э, гром не гремит, э, мужик не перекрестится, сейчас а, вдруг появилась аннексия Крыма, агрессия э, против Украины, вдруг начали шевелиться. Извините, до этого все было. Не надо было допустить того, чтобы это систематизировалось, получили концептуальную какую-то подлюбку в лице Евразийского какого-то э, экономического союза, до этого таможенного союза, то есть разные такие. Это приобрело такой международный масштаб, и сейчас начинает там Видите, уже угрозы. Угрозы всегда были. И об этом угрозы всегда поднимали вопрос. А повышали. То, что в свое время не усмотрели, а сейчас вот приходится машинации плоды нашего, может быть, умышленного не внимания или э, такого неподходящего внимания на эту проблему. И сейчас получается, что мои друзья оказываются в тюрьмах в Азербайджане. Вопрос не только, а, а что, ты там а в Евне все время нарушал? Нарушал. А сейчас у него очень хорошая поддержка без Путина. У Сайбайджана она хорошая поддержка без Путина. А с ними же не перебывали бы. Я не знаю, честно говоря, как, как должен вести себя Европейский Союз. Я знаю, что мы должны делать. Мы должны продолжать работать, так и как работать, естественно. Собирать факты, выступать против всех действий, которые нарушают достоинство человека человек в наших странах. Но все-таки надо что то, что позиция Европейского Союза и Союзных Штатов с точки зрения продолжения санкций против путинской России, она не будет ослаблена. Как в свое время это уже испытано, модель, которая была реализована президентом Рейгеном после формировки, что Советский Союз это не Вот этот модель должен продолжиться. Потому что по-другому, по-другому, невозможно выйти из этой ситуации. Одно зря, когда мы в рамках наших национальных государств можем выступить и работать, а другое зря просто такой системы, которая имеет транснациональную, криминальную, коррумпированную характер во главе, значит, Кремля.
Это не сильно подземный цитат. Это однозначно не правда. Поэтому здесь ответственность международных тех структур, которые стоят на позициях прав человека, верховенства права и демократии, намного увеличивается, потому что это получилось в результате непроделенной работы до этого периода. Упущение, которое привело к тому ситуации, в которой сейчас мы находимся. Я думаю, очень много, конечно, вопросов, которые есть, нам нужно еще больше думать. И больше конкретную практику и стратегию разрабатывать в наших ситуациях. Но я в конце хочу от моей имени, я думаю, от многих. Да, приветствовать не то, чтобы передать приветствование наших друзей на прессу, чтобы они сохранили свою стойкость и не говорили, что мы с ними. По именам я уже не буду перечислять. И, конечно, со старейшим освобождением и социализированием спасибо. Thanks a lot. Uh, we've, had, we've had a lot of uh, very strong uh, presentations, um, and I think there are a few common themes that emerge from all of them. Uh, certainly, that it would have been better to pay attention to human rights earlier, but of course, this is the first panel, so this lesson has obviously, at least the civil society forum, has been learned. Secondly, the importance of uh, political prisoners has been stressed. Um, I, I think that it might be useful to really mobilize across Europe for a Europe about political prisoners, including all the Eastern Partnership countries, um, and put this on the agenda even stronger than it is now. And then we've also heard from Shana Ismail about the closing space and the challenges of uh, legal reforms, of funding restrictions, which make it increasingly difficult for independent civil society to work and put lots of difficult choices before them how to survive, as she said, physically, financially, and morally. Um, it would be really interesting, and I, I would like to bring you back in for one minute, because now we've had some of the NGOs, uh, some very impressive uh, assessments. What do you think the EU and the country like Sweden, which cares about human rights within the EU, can do to address those issues that we've just listened to? Ah, we need oh. this Swedish back. <laughs> it's working. Is it just us? It's working. Yes. It's working. Okay. Yes. Fine. It is working, yes? No? Being closer. Yeah, we're, you hear me? Yeah. We're here. Yeah. Closer. We're here. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. yeah. And interpret it. No, no, no. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, from my side, I mean, I listened very attentively, of course, to what has been uh, said here. I've touched upon it already in my, my, my short intervention, or long intervention. <laughs> that, that, you can't hear. Uh, we can't hear. Can't hear. What, what, I want, oh, yes. what I wanted to say is that, that we, of course, from Sweden side and from EU side, we try to help, try to, to assist in this situation. We are aware of, of uh, developments. We, we uh, do follow what is happening uh, very closely in this area. Um, see, to the Sweden side, we, we have a bilateral uh, Development cooperation program, which covers all, all six countries where human rights uh, issues are, are are very important. So that's how we try to, to, to work with this. This means both working with, uh, well, in particular, working with, with uh, civil society um, organizations, including I think uh, some of the organizations that are, are present here, but also to, to work, for example, with uh, universities. Uh, Education programs in, in the area of, of, of um, 
rights uh, and, uh, and uh, other programs, uh, including in the areas of, like uh, independence of, of judiciary, fight against corruption, areas that are very closely linked to, to uh, the enjoyment of, uh, of human rights. And of course, we also use uh, other instruments. We have like like uh, the political dialogue, the, the contacts we have with uh, leaders in, in your countries, uh, both bilaterally and, and uh, multilaterally. We make statements, uh, particularly particularly on the on the EU level. We make statements. So there have been many statements, uh, public statements made in different forums regarding these uh, arrests of, of human rights defenders in. in your countries, the, the situation of, of uh, political prisoners. They are all publicly available for, for everyone to see. Uh, for example, on the, on the web page of the uh, EU delegation to the uh, OC, and so on, 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 on other web pages. We also make national statements uh, occasionally, even though, at least on Sweden's side, we, we believe that. Uh, when there is an EU statement, we will normally not make a Swedish one because that would make it unclear whether we stand by all EU statements, and we do. Um, so th those are some of the, of the things that we do. But as, as I, I, I said, I think that there is a limit to what the outside world can achieve. We can do, and we try to do, uh, what we can. But the, the real movement for, for change, the real process for change, has to be uh, internal ones. This is my, my deep conviction. And this is, I think, what happened in Ukraine, for example. It was, it was uh, internal forces that uh, changed the situation, not, not external forces. Uh, and I also believe that... Uh, I don't think anyone questioned that really now here, but still would like to say that, that we believe that having contacts with all, all governments is better than having no contacts because if we if we isolate fully and have no contacts then we have no avenue of, of, of dialogue we have no opportunity to, to raise the concerns that we have so we don't think that that full isolation is is, is the way the way forward yes. but maybe no one thinks that but uh, i just wanted to to say that and we have not forgotten i mean some of the issues that have been brought up here that what happened uh, in uh, after the presidential elections in Armenia in 2008, this is this is brought up by, by the EU and, and by EU member states when we have, have, have the, the opportunity, when we have the occasion to meet with, with leaders from Armenia. Uh, and uh, we are as, as maybe not as frustrated, but we are also frustrated that we see no no uh, no clear progress. So I, I'm getting signals. We have until 12 o'clock, right? And then there is lunch. Um, I do wonder if we shouldn't take two or three short and question interventions from the floor or not. We don't have time. Yes. Well, let's let's take. Um, well, why don't you? Yeah, why don't you come? Okay. But let's make it really short. Okay. So May I use down. microphone? Yes, sir, I think yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Tamak Intervention in the Development Foundation from Georgia. Since Georgia is the president of the panel, I would like to remind some temporary challenges regarding human rights and focus mainly on minority rights. Uh, Georgian government adopted very progressive legislation on anti discrimination, which was welcomed by civil society organizations. But unfortunately, provisions of law uh, rarely applied in practice. Over two years, we have seen increased number of religious tensions, especially against Muslim community in Georgia. Rights of LGBT groups are violated, and state fails to address these problems and punish perpetrators. And impunity of uh, perpetrators is a main challenge and hate speech media and political discourse as well. I'd like just to draw your attention on these problems with a uh, challenge for security situation for Georgia as well. Okay. Thank you. Can I? 
Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that it's worse than the European Union protesting about what is happening in a place like that. Like that. Azerbaijan is also being very aggressive towards European Union countries. In Poland, the, uh, in Krakow, uh, uh, Foundation gave a prize to sorry, I was here. No. And the Azeri ambassador in Warsaw uh, phoned all the members of the jury uh, in Poland, including the representative of the president of Poland, demanding to know how they had voted and protesting and complaining that they have voted to get this price. So they are going outside. Today in this, in this building, we have members of the Azerbaijani delegation who are trying to destroy uh, the posters of the, uh, of the people in need um, organization that could depict the situation of Azerbaijan. Uh, one of them threw himself on the Christina Vachinaite, which is a, a, a heroic act, but very aggressive. So it's not just that the European Union isn't doing enough. Countries like Azerbaijan are trying to influence actively the situation inside the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes. My name is Plamena Gurisova. I'm representing the Bulgarian Environmental NGO. And I have a couple of few comments, very brief comments, questions, and requests. Uh, Arzu, I very much appreciated your presentation, particularly about the moral of the civil society of New York, because this is a very important issue. Uh, Shala, you mentioned something about the uh, new classification of the civil society organizations and I would appreciate to hear it again because some of them I didn't hear. And um, uh, Sasha uh, pointed out very carefully some of the problems that we should uh, uh, concentrate in our discussions. Martin, thank you very much for your really practical uh, directions concerning our future possible actions. Because uh, the priorities of the, of the Swedish government are very interesting and we really can find out how to cooperate and of course how to get uh, some assistance from the Swedish government. Um, okay, are you, one, no, no. Okay. Are you, thank you very much. We have to make discussions and conclusions based, based on real facts, not just propaganda, you know, information. It's very difficult to find out which is, uh, which is a real fact. And uh, we talk about human rights, but we didn't mention human responsibilities. Lack of responsibilities create the impression of the civil society and the people that they just have the rights, and then no democracy. So, what else? And the last, Please not be a uh, court. Take the role of a court. Let's not uh, pre pretend that we are judges. We are just members, representatives of the civil society relations. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. For the last statement from you. Thank you very much.